Welcome to another lesson on Fearfully and Wonderfully Made and the difference that grace makes. Thank you so much for joining me. This is lesson five that we're doing in this particular series, uh, and I'm excited to be teaching it. Uh, I've already had some ladies tell me that it's been helpful to them to understand themselves, their family, their husbands, and um, just a lot of people. And so um, I'm, I'm grateful for the good that it's doing. Uh, today is lesson number five, as I mentioned, and this is going to be the personality of people who just like to research things, investigate things, and um, I think you'll be um, drawn in to Nicodemus and Thomas and Jacobed. We're putting a lady in here, too, to help us understand ourselves better, maybe, uh, but we're going to borrow a verse from Paul, even though we aren't talking about him. Galatians 2.20 says this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Just can't beat Galatians 2.20 for a life's verse, even, if you're looking to have one. But the purpose of this series is to understand our uniqueness, how God made each of us individually. He loves the, the variety of things. Uh, we've talked about the fact that he gave flowers their fragrance and different colors, and he gave food its taste because maybe he just likes to see that look on our face. That's borrowed from Max Lucado. But we talked about uh, Paul's personality. He was a crusader before conversion, after conversion, uh, purposeful, principled, controlled, energetic, like so much energy that most people couldn't have kept up with Paul, I'm pretty sure. Then the second personality we talked about how much Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John the Apostle were alike. You re recall that um, they were the two left standing at the foot of the cross, and Jesus gave the Apostle John charge of taking care of his mother. So we believe that probably Mary was, the, earthly speaking, the most influential person in Jesus' life. She birthed him and nursed him. She had to be saved, just like the rest of us. She delivered him. He delivered her. Uh, is how we worded that. But those personalities are just helpers. They're always in the in the trenches, getting things done. They're reliable. Some people you can't rely on, can you not? Uh, but they were reliable. And then the third personality we talked about was Saul and David and Michal and Moses and Jacob. So many fit that personality. Now Moses, remember, he started out as the meekest man in all the earth. Maybe he still was, but when he had to come to the forefront to get a job done, he could get it done. They're just achievers. Like, how do you lead a million people or more through the wilderness? How did Moses do that? The meekest man in all the earth. So God equips us for whatever he has for us to do for him. And then last week we talked about Joseph, just the dreamer, the individualist. They don't mind being different than everybody else. We know he was um, different than his brothers even and how God used him. Just um, introspective and intuitive and uh, creative. The one from last week was, was that. And then this is the fifth one, the investigator, the researcher kind of personality. And maybe um, once you understand their unique personalities, it will help you to understand yours or somebody's that you know, somebody that you know. So we'll just kind of go right on. Let me have a word of prayer and then we'll jump into the characteristics that we see obvious in this particular personality. Lord, thank you so much for today, for your blessings, for the opportunity that we have to live and breathe and have our being. Lord, you've given us so many things and we're so grateful. Thank you for um, having grace in our lives, on our lives, all the way through our lives. Lord, we see it. Every day we see it. We feel it and we thank you for that. Thank you that we're different and that um, we can enjoy other people's personalities. We can understand our own and understand other people better. Be more effective for you and I pray that you might guide our thoughts now. Be so grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the first trait about this personality, they're open and receptive to new ideas, and they actually enjoy investigating things in detail. Like, they just can't get enough of it. I was telling the class that this is my older daughter, Meredith. Um, she said, it's almost a disappointment when you're finished researching. Like, that is the, that's the thrill of it, is the research of something. But remember Nicodemus, he was a man of the Pharisees. It says in John chapter three, ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. That's how John chapter three starts out. He came to Jesus by night, why at night? Now he possibly could have been afraid. However, just a few chapters later in chapter seven, he's not afraid at all. He comes with a bunch of his friends and he 
um, defends Jesus basically is what he does. So maybe he wasn't afraid in chapter three. Maybe, keep in mind he was a lawyer. I'll say that. Most lawyers are not uh, shy. So I don't know. I, I mean, it's up for speculation why he came at night, but maybe he just wanted Jesus to himself. He needed to know some information and that was the best way he thought he could get it. No flattery, no lofty or buttery language, just right to the point, respectful, but straight shooting. That's how these people are. That's how Nicodemus was. Um, and he said, he used scientific kind of language, kind of goes along with their personality, just very matter of fact, factual. Uh, he said, we know this because of, of the, we know X because of Y. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. We know that. Why do we know that? For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And so we see Nicodemus in this first trait right off the bat. But I want you to think about Jochebed. We don't know a lot about her, of course, from scripture, but it does say this in Exodus 2. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. I'm going to stop right there and say, she only hid him and took care of him because he was a goodly child. No, anyway, I'm sure that's not what the scripture means, but if he had not been a goodly child, would you have hid him three months? I don't know. It just strikes me as funny. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river spring. So it was papyrus reeds. And then she coats it with something to make it float. And now it doesn't say that she did a lot of research before she did that. However, and maybe she was into boat building. Who knows? But if you had to build a little boat that would float, would you have to do any investigating and research to figure that out? So I put her in this category too, because I feel like I can we can read between the lines and see her in this particular personality. The second trait of these people, they pay close attention and analyze from their very own perspective. They're not picking up on somebody else's perspective. They have thoughts of their own. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? How can these things be? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's thinking through it. From his perspective, this is not possible is what he's saying. Do you remember Thomas? He said, except I see in his hands the print of the nails, talking about the Lord after he had appeared to the other disciples in the upper room and Thomas was not there. And he told the other disciples when they were saying that they had seen him, except I see it and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So those with this personality analyze everything. Do you know somebody who does that is just analytical? Um, when Meredith was younger, since we're talking about her, we have all the different personalities just about represented in our family. But um, when Meredith was young, I mean, just a young girl, she wanted to know who created a Kleenex box to where you pull out one Kleenex and the other one just stands there and waits for you to pull it. Just always thinking through things like that. So this personality analyzes things. They don't really, they aren't really associated with the word feel. It's always think. They are using their brain all the time and maybe need to be reminded that God also gave them a heart to feel things because they're a little slower at that. Okay, trait number three, they're the most inquisitive of all the different personalities that we're talking about. They just have to ask questions. They have to think things through. They love to think. When Meredith was younger, I would have to say, just stop thinking. You're overthinking this. Whatever the situation might have been, you're overthinking it. Don't do that. Uh, so they're the most inquisitive of the different personalities. Remember Nicodemus saying, how can these things be? Just wanting to ask all the questions. Uh, so these possess strong contemplative skills. Like we said, they're thinkers. Because Nicodemus is still asking questions, Jesus meets him where he is and what he's all about. Um, he doesn't give Nicodemus the answers exactly that he's looking for. He does say you must be born again, but he gave him a research project because remember, um, he just needed something to verify. Um, can a man enter into his mother's womb again and be born? It's almost like, okay, here's your research. You're wanting research, Nicodemus. This is what you do. You go back and read the old scriptures, Daniel 7, Numbers 21. You go research it and figure out who I am. That's what you want to know. So you go figure that out. Uh, and you know what? Nicodemus did his homework. Good for him. How do we know? Because the next time we see him is in chapter 7, coming to Jesus' defense. He cites Jewish law back to the people who would be willing to silence Jesus. And uh, so we see that playing out in his life. Jochebed, what an amazing woman she was. She found answers for herself and passed them on to her three children who were amazing in their own right. Can you imagine giving birth to Moses? 
Miriam and Erin. Yeah, she obviously had much knowledge and she was willing to share that knowledge. We're talking about three of the greatest leaders in Israel's early days were her three children, how much she must have known and, and passed on to them. Uh, I'll just throw this in right here. I'm always just a bit amazed whenever women, especially, come to know Christ, or they say they were saved when they were at whatever age, but their children are not drawn in to them. And I realize children have minds of their own. Even Adam and Eve were perfect, God's children, and they had minds of their own. However, a, parent, a mother especially, who doesn't have such a burden spiritually for her children, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that. Um, and so, good for Jochebed. She passed on what she knew. It was important to her for her children to grasp those things. Number four, the, the fourth trait, have a, they have a passion for collecting things. Now, I know you may be thinking dishes and shoes or whatever it is, but this personality, they, can, they collect thoughts and ideas and knowledge and silence. They collect silence and they collect space. They want a little bit of space. It's almost like they put their hand out and draw a circumference around them and that's their space. They like that. Um, in John 3, Nicodemus left with his questions unanswered. He had to think about it. But he came to the right conclusion after doing so. He's collecting all of his thoughts. He's doing his homework, as we were saying. Uh, it's something of a quiet inner power that these people, this personality has. Um, even Meredith's children, who are 14, 11, and 8, they know that she gets on what she calls sensory overload. And sometimes I'll just say, let's just back off and let mom have a little space. Yeah, she's on sensory overload. Um, so this personality, they learn to function within their own inner world. I would say this, this personality has a hard time trusting people, especially if they're ever betrayed. Um, they have a hard time trusting people. Uh, they, all, they want a safe space um, somewhere where they can draw into themselves and, and be a little bit protected there. Okay, the fifth trait, they generally avoid anything that could draw attention to themselves. They are not looking to be in the spotlight. They're not looking to be on the stage. People ask me, can does Meredith sing? I say, yes, but, she has, but you have to give her a court order to get her to do it. She sings. Monica gets up there relatively easy, easily, more easily than Meredith does anyway. And Meredith does sing. She sang last Sunday in the trio with Monica and, and Jonathan. Did a great job. She harmonized with anybody, but she's not just looking to put herself out there. So they don't draw attention to themselves. We mentioned Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He was a lawyer. He wasn't shy, but he still came by, by night. But when he was in work mode, he obviously was not drawn into himself. Jochebed, after she had laid Moses in the river, she walked away. And Miriam, his sister, is the one who watched for him from afar, it says. Uh, in the Bible. People with these traits hate to share their thoughts publicly. As soon as the demand is made in a group to exchange views spontaneously, most of them let down the shades, pull down the shades, and think, how, they, how, how may they quietly and quickly escape whatever situation they're in? The sixth trait is sometimes they feel that if they share themselves, they might lose themselves. Um, why would Nicodemus not continue his discussion with Jesus in John chapter 3? Where did he go? If you go back and look at that, Jesus is talking for several verses and and then it, it goes on to some, something else. Where did Nicodemus go? Um, these people are a bit of an enigma and hard to figure out. They can easily come across as arrogant and aloof just because they're quiet. They're not the talkers in the crowd. And so some people are a little afraid to approach them. Um, these people are, are an enigma, I mentioned that. Um, Try not to take it personally. I will say, if they, if you have a friend like that, don't take it personally. It's their defense mechanism to withdraw, um, which can sometimes be a social hindrance probably. It may even be a little bit, create a little bit of difficulty in relationships because they have to have their space and their own thoughts and pull back just a little bit. But they have surprising minds. Um, they're sometimes reluctant to share whatever is in their mind, but they are deep thinkers, as we mentioned. Um, I want to mention this about Thomas right there. You know, he said, unless I can see and feel and touch for myself, I will not believe. But he wasn't asking for anything that the other disciples didn't already have. They had seen Jesus and, and knew. They saw and, and had personal connection with Jesus. He was only asking for what they already had experienced, not for any special favors or anything like that. He just wanted the proof for himself. Uh, 
Let's see, number seven. These are analytical, these people, this personality. Analytical, I want to find the ultimate simple explanation for everything. Nicodemus, see, when he went to Jesus, he wanted a quick, simple answer. Well, it was, he was, Jesus was gonna have to meet him where he was for him to be content with an answer or what he needed to know. Um, Thomas himself, he acquired a nickname. What do we know about Thomas? What is he called in the, in the Bible? Or with everybody who knows Thomas, doubting Thomas, uh, because he did doubt. Wherefore didst thou doubt Thomas? Um, if they needed it, no, they are analytical, observant, and quiet, but not shy. Thomas and Nicodemus both were willing to speak right up and say what they needed. Um, so if they need to know something, don't insult their intelligence and start back at the beginning. They've already thought through a lot of it, whatever it is. Um, be like the little boy who needed to know what time it was, and he ran right past his, his dad in the den and ran to his mother in the kitchen and said, hey, what time is it? And she told him, she said, why didn't you just ask your dad when you came through there? He said, because I didn't want to know how the clock was made. I just wanted to know what time it is. Yeah, don't insult their intelligence. They just want a simple answer usually. Uh, I, when I was thinking about Jacobed and making that little bed um, for Moses, I was thinking, I wonder how many of those women tried to give her advice. She didn't need them to say, this is, this is the kind of reed that you need. I'm sure she had already thought through that. Oh, you need to smear this pitch on here in a certain way so that no uh, water will leak through. Like she probably had some people try to give her advice. She had it under control. She's a thinker. Um, trait number eight, they often make great counselors because they can follow, follow the monologue of others for a long time. If somebody's talking to you on and on and on without taking a breath, do you ever feel like your eyes are crossing or something and you can't quite hang on to the conversation? Um, these are great counselors. They don't mind you talking for a long time and they're thinking through everything and assessing it. Uh, Jochebed, her wisdom and advice undoubtedly catapulted Moses, Miriam, and Aaron to their prominent positions. Each of them had distinctly different personalities. Since we're talking about personalities, Moses and Aaron were completely different and Miriam was completely different from them. But you remember Miriam was um, a leader of the women of the Israelites, leading them in song, playing the timbrel, and all of the things that she did. But she was a, con Jochebed was the consistent influence in all three of their lives. These people are good conversationalists if you can ever get them to open up and talk to you. They have a wealth of knowledge. Um, and they make great counselors. I was telling the class, Meredith and Monica both work at the same place. Monica works in a very private office. You've probably heard me say, I might've said it one time before, that if she has to open a, a Diet Coke, a bottle, she turns it slowly because the office is so quiet. She's our talker in the family. Meredith, not so much because this is her personality. She has a job where she talks all day. She's an advisor, a counselor. Yeah, she sits in an office, but her first day on the job, it was sensory overload, like we're talking about. And when Meredith went to find her, excuse me, when Monica went to find Meredith at lunchtime, Meredith had crawled up under her desk. She has a private office. She had the door closed, the lights out. She had crawled under her desk and turned the heater on and was taking a nap. And um, that's how Monica found her the first day because she just had to walk away from all of the dialogue that she had, had to be part of. But anyway, just some more fun facts about this personality, or facts, I don't know if they're fun. Um, they don't like to be pressured for fast decisions. They cannot, they absolutely cannot do it. We laugh because Monica and Meredith ride together to work and even getting Meredith to say what time she wants to leave, if she's leaving early or whatever, Meredith says, oh, I really don't wanna make that decision right now. Um, but anyway, it's funny to see it and it helps you to understand people if you know their personality traits. Um, another fact, everything is calculated in their minds in, in terms of energy. How much energy is this going to take and is it worth it for me to expend my energy on that? It's like the little meme or whatever I saw this week where somebody says one plus one is five and the other person says, yeah, whatever, just go with it. it takes too much energy. I don't care if you think one plus one is five. Uh, another fact, they want to appear competent at all costs. Yeah, they don't want to appear incompetent ever. They don't wanna be caught off guard. They may be heard saying, I understand the concept. Don't, don't explain the concept to me. I understand that. Go from there. Um, when I was um, past, a pastor's wife, I directed the weddings for my husband. He just had me kind of run the, the rehearsal part of it and then the, the wedding itself. And Brother Wright, the pastor that we had, um, right before Dave became pastor, um, he 
his wife, his first wife had died and he was getting married the second time. And he wanted a quartet song at his wedding. Well, he's the boss. We're gonna, we're gonna do whatever he wants. He had been the boss for a long time before this point and Dave was marrying them. So Brother Wright said he wanted this particular song sung and we went, we went with it. We're gonna do it. Four, four men, we're gonna sing a quartet song at his second wedding. And so I always typed out like pages of instructions, exactly who should be where, what time everything was happening, so that nobody was confused the day of when the pressure was on and nerves were up or whatever. So I'm standing in the back of the auditorium and the prelude music starts and the quartet from behind the piano, way up at the front, I couldn't get to them, I was in the back directing, would be as soon as it started, they stood up and sang that song. That wasn't where it was on the instruction sheet. And I'm thinking, okay, all right, that's not in the right order. What are we going to do? So I thought, okay, well, when we get to the point in the program where it's supposed to be that song, I guess we'll just get right over that part and not have the song then because they've already sung it. Lo and behold, they knew they had messed up and they didn't sing it at the right part, but I guess they never picked back up their instructions that we had gone over the night before and they stood up and sang it again in the wrong place. Now I'm really stressed in the back of the auditorium. They sang that song four times trying to get it right. They did finally get it in the right place one of the four times. Um, but anyway, some people, you, you don't want to insult their intelligence and people don't want their intelligence to be insulted. Sometimes you just feel like you have to help people out. You know what I'm saying? Uh, these people hate to waste anything, anything, time, money, resources, anything. They are not wasting it at all and not their energy that we've already mentioned. <clears throat> Number five, extra fact, they actually enjoy their own company. Overly emotional people are exhausting to them. They feel like they have to engage. I love the quote, if you can't, just, if you can't stand to be by yourself, you probably bore other people too. Um, another fact, they often get stuck researching a thing instead of doing the thing that they're researching. Reading about it and planning it are more exhilarating than doing it. Um, they run on limited fuel, you know, so um, they actually enjoy the research part of that, but they're incredibly thoughtful. I will tell you this, if you have a friend with these traits, um, they have thought through everything. They give you the perfect gift. They give you the perfectly written, most beautifully composed cards that they ever give you. They've thought through everything. They're willing, they collect all of those things like their thoughts and their space and their silence and all of those things. And they are, I wouldn't say stingy with money, but they're very careful with money. But if they give you something, they've thought through it and they've given you a nice gift. That's what I have found to be true. So I hope this helps you. Maybe you see yourself there. Maybe you see one of your children there, like I did, or a spouse or somebody. But anyway, I hope it will be helpful to you to know how to appreciate the differences that God makes in us uh, and um, get along better. Be a better servant of the Lord, better in the work of the ministry that he's given you to do. I hope it will be a blessing to you just to know these things. Um, thank you for joining me. Next week we go to trait number six, and I'm looking forward to that, and I'll see you then.